Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's three o'clock and we're just about ready to get started. We'll give everybody another minute or so to get in and uh, participate in this session. I'm going to hit uh, mute for everybody, but certainly when we get to the point for people who are on the Zoom itself to uh, oh, Simone. ask questions, uh, I would encourage you to unmute yourself at that point uh, to, to go ahead and do so. We'll just give everybody, like I said, another minute or so to get in, and then we'll also start recording this session so that it can be distributed on Friday uh, out to the entire community. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin McGowan, the superintendent of schools here in Brighton, and uh, really glad that you could join us, whether it's by Facebook Live or here in the Zoom meeting itself. Uh, looking forward to talking to you a little bit about our reopening plans and walking through your questions, your comments, and following up on those, and then giving you an opportunity to engage in that discussion as well. Uh, the plan is to really divide this hour up into three segments. The first 20 minutes or so right now, we'll spend on your thought exchange feedback. And then the next 20 minutes will be any live questions that people would like to ask uh, via the Zoom format. In the last 20 minutes, uh, we'll go through all of the comments that are on Facebook Live and try and address as many of those as possible. I will uh, warn you ahead of time, uh, there's a lot. I know there's a lot that people wanna dig into and talk to. We likely won't get to all of it at this point. We'll get to as much as we possibly can. But on Friday, we'll send out a recording of this meeting. We'll send out a summary of all the uh, third, uh, thought exchange feedback as well. And uh, in, within the thought exchange feedback, the areas where you have asked questions will have answers attached to them. And so many of them do at this point, uh, the first, within the first couple hundred of the feedback of the uh, ranked comments, uh, the, those that were phrased as questions have been answered, but all of them will be by Friday. There are many of them that say, please see the answer above because there, there was a lot of repetition in some of the questions, uh, but we'll have all those answers to you. So if it's not answered today, it will be, I can uh, promise you that, uh, but we'll do more of these as well. And we'll also do them at some different times so that uh, people who don't have the opportunity to participate now during this uh, time frame uh, can have that opportunity. Uh, a few announcements as we start. First of all, thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, the, the two groups that came together as part of this task force, the operation side and the instructional side, uh, to really dig through lots and lots of conflicting data, conflicting guidance from the state education department uh, to the Department of Health. And when I say conflicting, not meant to sound like in an adversarial or a complaining way, but this is complex, right? And so there needed to be a lot of clarification offered along the way and uh, FAQ documents produced and that still continues to evolve as the, the people involved in some of this decision-making learn the impact of some of the, the regulation and guidance on the field, and they can make adjustments where needed. And also as we learn more about the spread of COVID and understand what's worked or not worked in other environments as well. So uh, it's really a work in progress that way. And we appreciate the clarity that we continue to get and the adjustments that are made along the way. But those two groups did really a great job. They were uh, staff members, uh, board members, uh, leadership team members in the district, parents, et cetera, outside experts as well, who came together to really talk about uh, what would make the most sense, what did we want for the kids in our community, what do we know about the guidance, what is it telling us to do, and sort through the myriad of details. In all honesty, we've just scratched the surface, right? So the initial plans, the draft plans that went out to you are the beginning of the conversation, but so much more needs to be developed over time, and it will. I want to give you an idea of that time frame too and what this is looking like. So we've put together out, we've, we've put to you a, a draft plan 
We're soliciting your feedback, getting lots of feedback, having conversations like this. Our plan right now is this Friday to send out a recording of this meeting, to send out a summary of the thought exchange feedback, as I had mentioned to you, and to condense all of that into an FAQ document, easy to read, a uh, quick reference for you to go through and say, these are, the, these are the things that seem to be on people's mind the most, and here's the, here are the answers to those questions. The following week, so through the course of next week, I'm referring to it internally as the detail week, right? And so we, we won't get through all the details, but we'll be able to dig through a lot more of the details. And what we'll be asking people to do is uh, have answered those survey questions around your intent to come back to school, around food and around transportation, because that will allow us next week then to dig further into the detail pieces and come up with more refined, clear, direct plans for people to see based on their feedback and based again on, on their, their ideas right now, whether they're going to be attending or not and what their needs are about transportation. Once we have a better sense of what those numbers are and what our capacity is, we can develop more detailed plans. We would send those out to you likely the evening of August 10th and say, okay, here's where we're at now. Here's the update. We want to be clear. We want to be direct with you. This is what we are planning right now based on what you sent back to us and what we feel like we can do. From that moment on, we're going to ask people to begin to make commitments and to say by the 17th, by the following week, with more clarity, here's now what I plan on doing. Here's what our family is going to do going forward. This is the option that we're choosing relative to I'm going to stay home remotely or participate in the hybrid program. And then from there, we would have the three weeks before school starts to, to make adjustments and continue that plan. Many people have asked, you know, is this long term? What does this look like? Can we commit to this for the first semester, the first quarter? We don't know. And part of the reason we don't know is the, again, the understandings continue to evolve and the learning about COVID continues to happen and adjustments are made. The guidance continues to evolve and we wanna be open to making adjustments. We also wanna make adjustments based on what's working and what's not working. So we are expecting this to be an evolution. We wanna maintain consistency and not be making haphazard changes constantly once we're up and running. We also want to be open to some flexibility in making changes as we need to. So it's very hard to say how long we're talking about. We want to evolve over time. And if we can provide more flexibility, provide more access, um, do that as we see how things are working and make those adjustments. Following in some ways the model that our state has used in terms of a phase one, two, three, and four reopening and think about how do we make adjustments along the way as the guidelines allow us to, as regulation allows us to, as the state allows us to, but uh, be open to that as well. So. Uh, we will make those adjustments, but we'll give you plenty of notice. We also will have pretty defined timeframes in terms of opting in and out of things. So when people say, well, I want the online version, but what if I decide I want to come back to hybrid? I start to feel more comfortable. Uh, we'll be providing people some timeframes for how that can work, when you can do that, how long it takes before you can jump back in. And likewise, if you decide, you know what, not feeling really comfortable, I'd like to go uh, virtual. We want to give you some pretty prescribed timeframes in terms of what would it take then uh, to have that happen also. So those are some of the pieces um, that are evolving. A couple of quick announcements before I dig into that thought exchange feedback. Um, Wednesdays, people have asked about how's that Wednesday going to work? What will that look like? At the six through 12 level, that Wednesday will look like your period by period schedule for a student, just not face-to-face -face in person, but it will be face-to-face -face virtually. So you would follow the cycle day schedule six through 12 on that Wednesday but virtually speaking. Now, does that mean the teacher will be teaching for the whole 45 minute, the 40 minutes um, of in-person the way they would be in the classroom? Not necessarily. We expect that we're maximizing that time. We expect that it's going to be face-to-face -face, and we expect that a large majority of that will be used, but it will be to the best extent possible, the most effective way to do that. It's not always effective to be lecturing at people for the whole 40 or 45 minutes. So we wanna be cognizant of that as well. But you will face-to-face -face meet on that cycle day schedule period by period like you would have as if you were in the building, just you'll be doing that remotely. At the K-5 level, we're planning for that to be a substantial day schedule. Likewise, it's not appropriate for a K-5 through student to be staring at a screen for five or six hours. We want to make sure that that makes the most sense and that teachers can develop a schedule that makes sense at their grade level and that's developmentally appropriate. So an example of that, it may start out with the entire class meets face-to-face -face first thing in the morning for that morning activity um, virtually. And then some instruction is um, introduced 
student may work independently then for some period of time. Maybe we're checking back then later on in that morning or midday. We're introducing additional material. And then perhaps there's small group or whole group work depending on the needs of the class or the teacher, again, face-to-face -face virtually. We're looking for a substantial schedule on that day, but we're not looking for six hours of looking at a screen. We want a lot of face-to-face -face, -face contact as much as possible, but in ways that are developmentally appropriate uh, for kids at that level. First week schedule. Just want people to be aware, and we'll be announcing this formally when the plans are allowed. We're planning right now for both Tuesday and Wednesday after Labor Day, both Tuesday and Wednesday, to be superintendent's conference days, and that Wednesday not to be that virtual day. We'd like the first interaction our kids have on Thursday and Friday to be in person when they develop a relationship with their teacher. We also need that additional time on Tuesday and Wednesday to be prepared for this very different approach and this um, continued building of the airplane as we're leaving the runway, right? So we need both of those days. But we do want that first interaction for our staff members with students to be in person on Thursday and on Friday. So there won't be that remote day on Wednesday for students, we will start in person on Thursday and Friday. That superintendent's conference day will essentially be what counts in terms of our student attendance uh, from the state as a, um, as a uh, snow day. We'll make adjustments to the calendar through the course of the year if we need to have an additional day of instruction, we'll have to make that adjustment. Right now we're planning on, again, that being a superintendent's conference day. Another question that's been asked often is about one-to-one -one and the opportunity for kids to have tools in their hand. We currently are one-to-one -one eighth grade through 12th grade, and we provided devices for K through seven students as needed. Last year would have been 12th graders also as needed. Uh, for families, we're planning on doing that as well and having a process for that like we did before. But we would like you to know we are moving towards a one-to-one -one environment for all students for this particular circumstance, but for later on when we feel like there are certainly possibilities where it may be necessary to make sure there's a device in every student's hands. The difficulty is in getting those devices right now because of supply chain issues. So we have that out and we are pursuing that very vigorously, but it will take time to get a device in everybody's hand. Just want people to know that that is certainly something in the works. Also a series of questions around protocol. What happens when somebody needs to quarantine? What will happen when there's a positive diagnosis? Will my child's class be shut down? Will the entire building be shut down? What's that gonna look like? What are the mechanics of that? I'm gonna say this several times when we start to go through the thought exchange feedback. Some of the answers are we just don't know yet. So we're working through developing those protocol. We will know them in all likelihood. We would expect to know that and have that information very clear before school begins. But that is something that we are working through right now. And that will be with our school physician developing that protocol but also in very clear communication with the Department of Health and understanding what makes the most sense, you know, necessarily closing one classroom at a time or the entire building. So much of that will depend on the exposure um, and the contact that people have had with a particular student, what the contact tracing tells the Department of Health about the progression of that um, diagnosis and how much contact people have had and what makes the most sense at that time. We will always err on the side of, of caution uh, but we'll do that in conjunction with the people that know a heck of a lot more than this not useful doctor, those that are the medical professionals that really understand public health and can help us uh, make those decisions. And, and in many cases, we'll make that decision for us, telling us what needs to happen. So those protocols will be developed. We don't know those yet, uh, but that's certainly something actively uh, being created at this point. And there's also been several questions about the virtual experience and what does that look like? I can't make an informed decision, people said, until I know what that experience looks like. Well, we are planning right now that program. And when I say in the materials we've um, presented already, you know, what that it will be based on capacity, people have said, well, what does that mean? Is that just mean scraps are left over? The reality is we are developing a hybrid approach that we feel is the best approach that we can uh, put together in terms of health and safety and maintaining some instructional continuity. And I'll talk about a couple of the reasons around the scheduling that we've been thinking about. That is the program that we feel is the best opportunity for public education in this community that we're offering to people. But want to be respectful of people's desire, whether it's medically necessary or simply out of their own anxiety to keep their children home and opt for a virtual program. Our challenge in presenting to you every detail at the moment is we don't know our capacity based on how many people would like that, number one, and number two, our internal capacity to support that in terms of human resources. What do we have available? As it's well known in our community, we don't have an endless supply of resources and finances, and the state and federal government has not provided that in any measurable way whatsoever for us to be able to offer resources to families. 
So what we want to do is provide the most effective, most uh, thorough, thoughtful, meaningful program we possibly can. But until we know who we have available to do that in terms of what our needs are for in-person instruction in the building and what our needs are for out-of-person in terms of how many people are saying they want that, it's very difficult for us to understand what capacity we have internally to support that. We will though, as we get further on in this and before we're asking you to commit, provide you with those details. So this initial, what are you thinking is helping us understand what our capacity is and what our needs are. The best way to simplify that is to say to you, when five first grade families have said to us, and I don't know if that's the number right now, but if they've said to us, no, we are opting for in-person or we're opting for virtual, we're going to stay home. Then we know, okay, we've got five first grade families, five first grade kids. What do we have in terms of staff available? And by the way, we're trying to accommodate because we're required to through ADA, provide reasonable accommodations for staff members as well. We've got the ability with staff members who are also requesting that accommodation. This is then what we can provide and how we can put that program together. I can tell you that in terms of virtual experiences, if we were to go all virtual and likely if we are virtual for some families just opting for that, what that means is that at the K through five level, you would have face-to-face -face instruction five out of every six days. And at the secondary level, four out of every six days with your teacher. So different than uh, where that was for people before in the springtime, where we weren't uh, mandating a particular number of times that you have that interaction with teachers, I can say to you with clarity that at the K-5 level, that will be five out of six days. And at the 6-12 uh, level, that's four out of six days. So if that gives people a better sense for the number of times they would be face-to-face -face with teachers, uh, that is the plan going forward at this point. But those additional details are being developed um, as, as we move closer towards knowing what our capacity is. I'm going to jump in and share the thought exchange feedback right now and start to walk through some of that before again opening it up uh, to a discussion with all of you also. This uh, first comment you should see up on your screen right now is around the steps a child staff member teacher uh, would take that protocol if people are testing positive and who will have to quarantine. And again, I just want to reiterate, we don't know yet, but that's in development with our school physician and, and certainly in consultation with the Department of Health and we would work closely on them uh, with them uh, for that and then communicate that out to everybody as well. So as that becomes available, we'll get that out uh, to you. Somebody's asking me here in the second comment to elaborate on what children will be doing on the days they are not at school. And again, without just reading the whole long written answer to you, which will be sent out, I will say this. A teacher will be planning for the A through L students on Monday for in-person instruction. They will then provide that same in-person instruction on Tuesday for M through Z. When the M through Z kids are in the classroom getting that in-person lesson, the A through L students are at home learning, working independently. What does that look like? That looks like activities, uh, materials provided, projects, follow up on the instruction that had been provided on that Monday, on that day before. So it's a continuation of the lesson, but in ways that can be done by students independently at home or the multiple lessons that are introduced on that first day. And so we're planning for that. If you think about this similar to a college student model and recognizing that a kindergarten student is not a college student, but the concept of you don't spend as much time in class at the college level you have to learn independently outside of class and complete activities. Again, age appropriate at the elementary level, very different than a college student. Don't want you to think I'm grouping them all together, but the instructional design concept being you're following up on the instruction that has happened in the classroom and then doing things that you can do independently uh, based on that instruction. Or the flip model, which is in flipped classrooms, you're doing work ahead of time that will be utilized when you are in the classroom. And so uh, you're, you're preparing for that, you're doing additional work, and uh, you then are, when you're in the in-person instruction, following up on what you did uh, to prepare for that lesson, just the flipped model of the classroom. And then the Wednesday being the whole group together that would, again, be following up on the instruction or preparing for instruction to come, I think uh, is something for uh, people to think about in terms of what does that look like. Uh, who is responding to the remote learners on instructional days? No, seriously, who is responding? There's no way to think a teacher can do both. So right now, the expectation is at this moment that that work is going to be independent and that the teacher themselves would be following up on it. Um, let me just make sure I do one thing here. Sorry for the pause. Uh, see a, a mark on the screen, so I wanna make sure I'm um, 
appropriately managing that piece um, of this. In any case, the uh, uh, the annotation ability, the um, the responding. So the teacher is not going to be able to respond in real time, of course, because they're working with uh, their other group of students that day. What we're looking at is how do we create a model where there are people available to provide additional uh, follow up and uh, perhaps uh, be available to answer questions, to support independent learners and families, uh, to dial in or zoom in and say, hey, we have a question on the assignment, how do we get help? Again, until we know exactly what our capacity is for that, it will be difficult uh, to, to know who's available, what time they'd be available, how that's going to work. But that is something that we're looking uh, to provide on that day. But essentially the follow-up is going to happen when the teacher is then with the students next and is evaluating their work, working with them on what went well, what didn't go well, while they were working independently. Uh, next comment here, will masks be absolutely mandatory for all staff and kids properly worn? This is essentially reduce exposure transmission, no exceptions. We don't have the option to provide no exceptions. First, the guidance tells us that we have to provide exceptions when medically indicated, and we will have a process set up for that where a doctor will need to uh, in some way provide a note, and then our school physician would evaluate that, whether or not that will be medically acceptable to not have a mask on. If a person doesn't have a mask on, uh, they will be socially distanced at all times. The larger question though is around, will they be mandated? Yes, we will expect that students and staff are always masked. However, we have given teachers the discretion to allow for mask breaks when students are socially distanced and obviously a masking break when students are eating, again, when they are socially distanced. So the point is, yes, 100% masking, the asterisk is, there will be times where teachers are allowed to provide a break only if social distancing is enforced, is guaranteed, is absolutely crystal clear. Um, but otherwise we would like to see people 100% masked at all times. And if they're eating, the eating is only uh, happening and the mask removal is happening when socially distanced. Um, I agree with this next person's comment about scheduling a town hall for some time after five. We'll definitely do that and provide alternatives. I, understand that the timing for people would work better if we provide different times, so we'll do that. I did talk about the um, at-home days. I'll go through uh, past that one. Um, in, in addition to the next one about what would happen if somebody's tested positive, that's the protocol question that we'll be waiting for uh, the development of that and communicate that very clearly uh, to the community. And there's the next bunch are about that. Somebody here is suggesting include written assignments, workbooks, and distance portion of learning, use of screen 100% of the time, required parent supervision, no question. So we wanna vary our types of activities and, and we don't disagree with that either. So we'll be passing that along to the people working on instructional design and who are facilitating those kinds of conversations because that, that is an important consideration. Um, next one is about, will there be an explicit plan for what happens? Yes, there will be. And again, explicit plan, but somewhat dependent on exactly what, it, uh, what that positive test entails and the types of contact that people have had and, where that's coming from. So some of that is dependent on individual situations, but we will certainly communicate clearly to people uh, what that uh, plan will be. Somebody here asked for a detailed plan regarding what remote learning will look like, and I did uh, just go through that as well. Uh, somebody commented for the community that everyone should be masked. Realize some people don't believe it's necessary, this comment is saying, and it should be mandatory for safety. And yes, uh, we will be requiring masking as well. It will become a part of our code of conduct, and if there's refusal to wear a mask, uh, we will handle that appropriately like we would other violations of the code of conduct, ultimately then requiring people to avail themselves of the online program if they're refusing to comply with that or the social distancing requirement uh, certainly will be part of, of uh, what we will request from people. Uh, protocol question again, and that will come out. We will provide that very clearly. Uh, somebody here commenting, uh, online instruction should be meaningful. Teachers should be able to have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with students. And again, I mentioned that at the beginning and that will be, be a, a very different approach. And there are a lot of people that did this really, really well in the springtime. We're gonna capitalize on those best practices as well. We've learned quite a bit from that and we appreciate that. We've also provided professional development additional training and we'll continue to work through that and help our teachers around instructional design, curricular design to really take advantage of that model the best uh, that we can. Uh, somebody here mentioned it, having a first grader liking as much paper learning as possible. And again, we'll pass that along. To those working on that instructional design, that's a great suggestion. We will mandate PPE for teaching uh, staff, and uh, we went through that. Uh, administrative support staff when interacting with students, absolutely. Requiring masks at all times to the next comment. And this comment here about devices uh, available for loan for remote learning as they were in the spring, yes, we are planning on doing that 
as well. So I'll take the last one here in the top 20. Lesson plans for remote learning should include as many non-digital options as possible. Uh, we don't disagree. We'll be passing that along again to those uh, designing the instruction, taking that into, into account, um, as well as much as is possible makes sense relative to the instructional design. I just want to comment again, every one of the comments that people submit, and there are 904 comments in this exchange, every single one is read from the lowest ranked to the highest ranked, and the questions are all answered to the best of our ability. And often when they are repetitive, it says, please see the answer above. We wouldn't keep cutting and pasting the same one over and over again. We want to make sure that you know we answer it and can be as efficient as possible in that. But every single comment counts and is reviewed, and it's an opportunity for everybody to participate in the dialogue, and it is meaningful to us uh, every single one. So I just want people to know they aren't disregarded when they're lower ranked. We look at every single one, we get an understanding of how people feel, and we break those out by building too to really get a sense for, you know, based on your demographic responses, how does Council Rock feel? How do most people at the middle school feel, et cetera? But we do review every single one of those. I'm going to transition now to a conversation with you, uh, the people that are on the Zoom, open up the floor, just ask uh, when you unmute yourself to simply say, um, you know, your, your name and let me know what level you're coming from so I can get a sense for uh, what the building is that has that particular perspective. And then uh, I'll answer to the, the best of my ability. I did see one pop up a couple of times and I wanna answer a question before it even comes up on the floor. Why the alpha split Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, the way we did that, as opposed to all of the same group A through L come Monday, Tuesday, and then M through Z Thursday, Friday with a deep clean on Wednesday. And the reason for that is this, the cleaning that we're doing between Monday and Tuesday, and then between Tuesday and when the kids come back on Thursday and Thursday to Friday, we consider that to be a thorough cleaning in the first place so that we can have kids come back in and parents feel comfortable and kids feel comfortable that there has been a thorough cleaning between those two groups. We would like the opportunity on Wednesday to do even more of that throughout the building and, and to reassess midweek and have that opportunity for the whole group to work together, albeit virtually. And Wednesday gives you the opportunity to do that. The problem with going Monday, Tuesday with A through L is then that group of kids, although having virtual on Wednesday, doesn't have that in-person contact with their teacher again until the following Monday. So they have the Wednesday opportunity, but then they are not in that same kind of contact on Thursday, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, et cetera. And likewise with the M through Z group, when they would only go to school on Thursday, Friday. The idea of having more regular contact, even though it's every other day, is important around social emotional health, but also around the instructional design. So that we're really maximizing our in-person time to leverage that in-person time the very next day with independent learning, as opposed to a gap where you're planning multiple days of independent learning, which then really doesn't capitalize as much or connect to the in-person experience. So our first conversation in that decision was, well, is it Health, from a health and safety perspective, does it make sense to be able to do that? Can we clean effectively to have two different groups in? And, and the answer is yes. We feel very comfortable in our ability to do that, or we wouldn't have gone to the next question, which was, okay, instructionally then, what's the most meaningful way to approach that? And it really made the most sense then um, to, to go ahead from an instructional and social emotional health perspective to do that split a little bit differently. I want to open up the floor now and ask people if they have any questions that they'd like to, to bring up uh, live in the room. And again, if you could just say your name and the level that you're coming from, that'd be great. Hi, Kevin. It's Marissa Barashi. How are you? Hi, Marissa. I'm great. Thanks for asking. How are you? Um, I'm good. Thank you. Um, question for you regarding private and um, parochial schools. Um, my kids go to Hillel. Um, I was wondering if um, the private schools are going to be following the Brighton plan. Um, and I'm also curious about transportation. For me, I live down the street from Hillel. It's not going to make a difference to me. But I'm sure there are other private transportation parents who live further away who are probably curious about what transportation will look like for their school. So it's a two-part question. Yeah, great, great question, Marissa. So um, two things. One, we will provide transportation for private parochial non-public students on the days that their child is to attend their school. If that's Monday through Friday, then that's when they'll get their transportation. If it's a hybrid model, that's when they'll get their transportation. Uh, that's, that's our obligation commitment to you, and we will continue to do that. We will um, 
we, I have no idea though, to, to your first part of the question, I have no idea in terms of the private parochial plans, whether they will follow Brighton's plan or not. Um, I'm hearing different pieces and we're in contact with different schools that are still having their plans evolve. Um, but some of them I would expect will go to school Monday through Friday and others will adopt a hybrid model. I think they have yet to all come to final decisions on that, but I would say you need to probably consult directly with that school because I think those, those plans are evolving and they will know best. Uh, but whatever the case may be, we will provide the transportation on that day for those students. Thanks, Kevin. You bet. Hi, uh, Jeremy Sarakin. Hello. Um, Hi, Jeremy. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, my kids are in eighth and tenth grade. My daughter's actually studying in the AIM program at Brighton High. So I'm actually going to go 100% virtual is what we want to do. I'm just, and maybe you said this and I was just, there was so much information. Um, for the days that aren't Wednesday, for every other day, how much of that would be independent learning? Would it be two? And they would, is some of it going to be like remote instruction? What's the plan for that? So for, for you mean for families opting for all virtual? Yeah. So uh, the general outline of that is that if we are offering virtual, it is four out of six uh, times in the cycle that you would be face to face at the secondary level and five out of six at the uh, primary level. But how that exactly, or at the K-5 level, how exactly that will work, I can tell you it's four out of six and five out of six, but okay. in terms of the details around time of day, um, when would that happen? Does it follow the cycle days? We don't know that yet. We're working through the details of that right now. And some of that will be dependent on, again, our capacity to offer both hybrid and virtual at the same time. Um, we're trying to match up the people requesting all virtual with staff, accommodating staff as well, uh, and their particular needs, immune compromise, et cetera, and finding a match between those two things to make sure we're offering the best program. Um, I don't wanna make that sound like it's out of convenience necessarily. It's simply out of human resource capacity and what we have available to us and uh, what our obligations are to both groups. Okay, cool. thank you. Thank you. You bet. Another question? Could I follow up on that, Kevin? Sure. Yep. Hi, this is just a, just to go along with the question about all virtual, which is what we're choosing as well. Um, is it, I know you have a lot to figure out with that. Is it your sense or understanding that if for people who make that choice, will the kids be able to take the courses that they had intended to take? I, I don't mean like electives and stuff. I'm talking about core courses, for instance, you know, if they're planning to take an honors math class, will they still be able to take those classes? Does that make sense? It does. It, I don't know the answer to that question yet, Heather. And, and okay. part of that is because just not knowing what we will have available when and how that's going to work and what the demand is. So how many people are actually opting for that? So uh, what I had said at the beginning around that time frame is when we are able to say on August 10th, here's what we believe the program will look like in more detail and then give people that week to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to provide more of that detail. Right now it's the let's figure out exactly what we think, at least at the moment, the, the need is, the demand is, and what we have available at that time. I'm not sure, but I will guess that we won't have capacity to be able to do virtual for every elective course. Sure. I would expect in the core areas we'd have uh, more capacity, but uh, there will likely have to be some adjustments to a student schedule if they're opting for all virtual. I just don't know what those will be at this point. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Another question? Kevin, this is Jessica Stett. Um, I have kids at Frez. Um, I'm wondering, thank you so much for doing this, by the way. I'm yeah. wondering if you, um, I know it's hard to answer anything right now because we really don't know, but I'm wondering if you've done any exploration of alternatives for uh -huh. online learning like um, plans um, to allow for more live instruction and just if you have any ideas about that, what you might be able to share. And the second thing I wanted to ask is once things shake out a bit, it would be really great if we could have maybe some groups of people come together that are remote only or hybrid and bring parents of that of those groups together so that we can help provide um, input. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. Thank you. You're welcome and thanks, Jessica, I appreciate it. Uh, I think that's a, first of all, that idea of let's have a focused conversation, how's it going, you know, maybe a couple weeks in with specific groups makes a ton of sense. I mean, to get much more specific feedback on how that's going. So um, thank you for that. 
in terms of exploring other, your audio started to click out, but I, I, so I didn't hear exactly the detail in terms of other platforms, but I will say this, uh, I don't think it was your fault. I think it's a number of people on the, on the meeting. Uh, we're definitely stretching the technology. I think that um, one area that we have looked is whether or not there is a BOCES opportunity for the online experience. So that we're collaborating with other school districts. There are some that have gone out and some districts have said to people, we're going to be collaborating with BOCES to do this. And this is the way it's gonna look. They don't know that yet because the BOCES program is not fully developed or refined at this point. So it would be something that we will take a look at, again, depending on whether or not we evaluate that program as robust enough uh, to offer to our community and whether that's been clearly organized and is put together, um, but we will take a look at that. In terms of other platforms, no, we haven't really been able to look at, okay, then can we opt in? Part of our problem is in ensuring that whatever program is offered is compliant with what the state is expecting and can be viewed as an alternative that New York State would accept as an alternative for us to provide to you. So we'll have to evaluate that as we go. We're certainly open to those pieces, but it gets pretty tricky then when we have to compare that to what the state will allow us to offer to you. And different than other states where there's a lot more open source opportunity for people to do, for example, home instruction using an online model that they pay tuition into or whatever, our state hasn't developed those over time. So we don't have that, that same opportunity. Kevin, can I, um, can you hear me? Sure. This, is, this is Talia. I, I want to echo what Jess said. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, here's my question, just to piggyback on what she said. Obviously, we're worried about kids' social emotional health. I mean, we're all worried about our kids. You're worried about your kids. Um, and whether it's people choosing remote completely, or if we have a shutdown and it becomes remote, I'm wondering if you guys are putting thought to um, how to still keep kids connected with each other. So, I mean, I think of in the business world, you know, how we try to keep teams still together, even though they're remote. Are you guys thinking also not only about getting instruction, but encouraging kids who might end up being home from feeling isolated? Because um, I know kids have friends, but to even integrate it more for kids who don't have a million friends or whatnot. Yeah, Ty, that's a great question, and, and you're welcome, and, and thank you for that, and and um, and Jessica's comment. I, I'm glad we could do this, and we'll continue to try try to reach out as much as possible. I one in our plan, there's a section on social emotional learning and mental health support, and our own efforts, and it's stated broadly, but I can tell you that that's a big part of our conversation is how to connect more and, and be more deep in that and, and pay really careful attention to that. And I think in the springtime, um, not everybody would have seen it because we were focusing on a lot of acute high level needs, but there were a lot of contacts made virtually between uh, staff members and families to try and monitor those needs that only grew while people were isolated and we know that. But that has to be a big part of our work. So I will say to you, there's an awareness on our part and there's a uh, an effort and an, um, you know, an understanding that that's what has to evolve over time. Part of the four out of six and the five out of six that I mentioned in terms of virtual contact is because we have a real recognition that that's so important, that that face-to-face -face contact. Among those four out of six and that five out of six, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is five out of six um, lectures going to happen or uh, teaching pieces happening that day. Teaching is more than just that lecture, that experience, or that that uh, actual instruction. A lot of it has to do with that connection and and those types of activities we do just to connect as human beings face to face. I mean, how many people in this group participated in Zoom happy hours or other social opportunities or Zoom gatherings or dinners with family on the other side of the country? And that all evolved. A lot of people talked about that in, on social media, and we saw a lot of you know, great examples of people connecting their families differently because people understood they needed that human contact, even if it couldn't be um, in, in the same room with each other. So yeah, th th that's a long way around saying we're aware of it, it needs to happen, but that that was a big piece of making sure we got to four out of six or five out of six days, that that human contact was so important. The instruction is key, but so too is the mental health, social, emotional part of that. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, if I could ask a quick question, Marcus Ragland, um, uh, we have a second grader at Council Rock, and um, in one of the communications that came out recently, uh, it mentioned for families that go with the remote-only option, um, there would be an instructional package. 
and um, understanding the the fact that the feedback is really important for you to figure out you know allocation of resources human and otherwise um, is is there an option that's being considered where there would be little to no interaction between um, a teacher and a student for those families that went remote only uh, and what is the what is the rough idea at this point of what that instruction packet, packet would look like uh, so let me just make sure I understand this question. So you're, and, and thanks Marcus for joining us. You're asking if there would be a remote only option that is largely independent with very little interaction with the teacher? Well, obvious, obviously the, the more interaction with the teacher, the better. Um, but, it, but the way the, the question, the response was worded, we were wondering whether or not um, that was being considered that for families that went remote only, that there would be little interaction with, with teachers. I see. So I think this is getting at something that came up a couple of times and I've been asked about the remote only option was almost written or uh, stated as like an after the fact, right? So we're going to see what we can do. And if we could do something, we're going to throw it at you. The, the hard part about this is it, it, it didn't mean to come off that way, but it also is the reality um, being totally transparent and honest when I say this to you that we're so stretched capacity wise, and that's what we're struggling with. And there's a real lack of clarity from the state regarding what the parameters of that program have to be, so, or, or what they should be. And so the state education department has asked for clarity from the governor's office, and we don't have that yet. And so that's part of what we're struggling with is exactly what should that look like? Could it look like, will it look like, or what will we, we be required to do? Now that also makes it sound like we just wanna do the bare minimum. We don't, our ethical moral obligation is that we want it to be as impactful a program as it can be. And for families too that choose that and be respectful of that choice that it's, you've chosen that, you, you're, you have, it may not be a medical need, it could be just simply that you're anxious about it. We wanna be respectful of that and say, great, then we're gonna to put together the best program we can for you. The key is what I just said, that we can for you, right? What we're struggling with is how much of an ability do we have to do that while also managing who's coming to the building? Because we don't have the financial ability to go hire 10, 20 teachers to provide this virtual program and we want to be realistic about that. So we didn't want to make it sound like, hey, it's no problem if you choose it. It's going to be powerful and robust and it's going to be this great virtual program. We're being very honest and saying we, we don't know yet what that program could look like while managing the in-person program. So it's not that there's any effort right now to plan a minimal program for face uh, to face when it's virtual. It's just simply we don't know how much we can commit to saying to you, it's going to be constant all day. This is what it will look like until we have an idea of what our capacity is. So the plan would be that it's four out of six at the secondary level and five out of six at the, at the K-5 level. Uh, we just don't know yet until we have a sense for capacity internally, but also demand what exactly that's going to be. Excellent. Thank you for your uh, your clarity on that and for everything that you guys are doing. I don't envy you, uh, and I appreciate all the effort you guys are putting in. Thanks, Marcus. I appreciate it. There's a lot of really good people working hard at it, so thank you for that. All right, I want to jump to the, the uh, question. Can I, can I just ask one super quick question? Sure. I'm, my name's Nelia, by the way. Just wanted mm -hmm. to ask, if a child wants, or if we as a family decide that we want to send our kids to school, and then we decide, you know, we want to take them and put them online altogether, or vice versa, that we start with them online and then we want to bring them back in. Is that an option? Or is it once you pick something like that's it? Yeah, so the great question. Uh, what we don't know yet is it, there, there, I would say in all likelihood, I would expect there'd be an option. There would be the flexibility that at some point you may decide to come back into the building for the hybrid model. And at some point families may say, you know what, I'm just not feeling comfortable with and with this and I see infection rates rising and I'm concerned, I wanna to go to the virtual experience. I, I would expect that we provide flexibility in that. How much flexibility though, and what the timeframes would be, we, we don't know yet. And so we'll develop that. That'll be part of the clarity that we provide saying this is, you know, there's a five day period between the two or there's an immediate transition and this is what it would look like. I just don't know yet, uh, but I know that's part of what we're talking about in terms of developing that. The, the best practice would be to have you be able to go in and out as quickly as possible. 
What we want to be careful though of is that we don't create a scenario where one week on, one week off, one week on, right? So like the in and out can be counterproductive to the classroom experience for everybody else um, and, and could be problematic, but we would want to provide as much flex flexibility as we possibly can. Thank you so much. You bet. So okay. let me jump to um, the, uh, let me jump to the questions here in the chat and kind of go through some of those and then uh, we'll, we'll go uh, to what's on the Facebook Live. So, uh, uh, Greg's asking, when both parents work in office, how are we supposed to help our K-5 student work remotely and be in two places at once? So, Greg, I, I really feel badly about this because we wanted to have everybody in person if it was all possible, particularly at the K-5 level. You're going to see other districts that are able to achieve that and have announced plans to do that, at the, particularly at the elementary level. I don't think at the secondary level, unless it's the very small uh, rural schools. So our planning went down that path of how can we possibly do this? The reality is when we reached a certain point in that planning where we made the decision that we could not safely operate that way. We didn't have the physical space to provide enough social distance or the capacity in terms of the manpower available to be able to separate kids to that degree in smaller groups and provide social distancing with the space available. It just was not feasible. And in the cases where we started to feel like, well, maybe we could, it got to a point where the program would be so disjointed and unproductive that it just didn't make sense. And then at the end of the day, we felt really uncomfortable from a health and safety perspective that we were doing the right thing and that we just couldn't pull it off and guarantee the, the healthy environment in terms of social distancing that that would require. And so that's how we landed at that particular place. That being said, recognizing that pre presents a, a tremendous burden to families. And that's why we were trying to offer that at the, at the uh, K-5 level. Um, so, you know, we do know that there are childcare programs available and I wanna make sure people are aware that the JCC has put together a program and people could take a look at that, we recognize there's costs to those things. Um, we don't have the capacity or the charter or the ability to offer a childcare program in district, or, or frankly, we'd be right back where we were talking about in terms of an unhealthy situation, not having the space for the people. Um, but there is that availability. I know the Y is working on programs as well. And I know there are other providers and people have talked about solutions privately um, in their homes, et cetera. But uh, it, it's not a burden we want to be placing on people. We want nothing more than kids to come back. And as soon as we can do that safely, uh, we certainly uh, will be doing that. Olga's asked about uh, platforms. We will be using uh, Zoom, but also in Schoology, there's an opportunity for people to use what's called the blue button uh, to essentially perform the same function as Zoom, and that's a possibility um, as well. Seesaw is being used at the K-5 level. Um, lectures are not being recorded and available for later uh, review in most cases. And at the K-5, uh, I'm sorry, at the K-12 level, um, the, there will be the occasion where maybe there's a guest speaker, there's another opportunity where that could be recorded or where people might zoom into that, but in the vast majority of cases, we won't be doing that. And part of that is a FERPA concern, the Family Educational Right and Privacy Act, where the activity happening in a classroom uh, between a student and a teacher is not something that should be broadcast to other parents. In other words, your child's question, your child's work in front of that teacher excuse me, is not something that uh, should be distributed out for um, other parents or families to participate in. So there's a privacy issue with uh, that type of interaction that we want to be aware of as well. Um, I did, somebody asked here about uh, different experiences in different districts, and that's really, uh, I, I think I covered that as well. We would have liked to have done that and just found it was not possible um, in this district. Danielle asked about group by neighborhood instead of last name. Neighbors could help each other, et cetera. Uh, the, the last name is likely to give us the cleanest uh, and most efficient split and, uh, and, and really was the most manageable and then um, uh, really makes the most sense in terms of K-12 distribution and the opportunity if six, 12 kids are home and can provide some of the childcare for K-5 families, um, it, it made the most sense to keep that within families, et cetera. And just uh, here. The, um, the chat questions, I don't want you to think these will go unanswered because there's 57 new messages in my chat that I can't get through without also 
not getting to the Facebook Live um, pieces. <coughs> Excuse me, these uh, chat questions, because this is being recorded, will become a part of our FAQ document as well. So uh, questions will all be answered. I'm gonna toggle over now and uh, take a look uh, specifically <coughs> at, the, at the Facebook Live feedback. Sorry, I should probably take a drink of water and make sure I'm answering uh, some of those as well. All right, so um, all right, let's see here. Just a general comment, trying to provide as much feedback and as much engagement as we possibly can with the community, not understanding some of the criticism from a frequent commenter, but um, really trying to engage as much as possible, we'll continue to do that. Uh, so uh, Whitney's asking about uh, this schedule maybe being a disadvantage. Um, that really, Whitney, I, I, I can promise you the teachers are very thoughtful in terms of their instructional design uh, to make sure there's opportunity for that type of follow up with kids that doesn't disadvantage them and thinking about that Wednesday whole group experience um, to capitalize on what kids did the day before but that it's really in the design and the management of that and, and they're they're certainly aware of that and thoughtful of that too so. Uh, is the children uh, senior person going last name still being considered? Yes, uh, Kiana, that, that is currently still what we are planning. We don't anticipate that uh, changing for the reasons I had uh, talked about at the beginning. Um, Heather asked a good question. So I want to make sure uh, the hybrid approach is, mon is scheduled Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday but on the cycle day schedule. So in the cycle day schedule, uh, we'll continue to follow cycle days, which determines you know, what exactly is happening for you on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. However, you, you are it, the, mon the Monday through Friday only determines whether you are in person or you are remote. And yes, the, the uh, remote program will be on a six day cycle as well, but it would be four out of six or five out of six uh, based on, on that particular design. Uh, let's see. I agree, Casey, around uh, it being uh, difficult in that design, not ideal for sure, but with a lot of confidence in our staff too, to be able to, to uh, plan appropriately for what makes sense K-5 for independent learning on that day when they're not here. Looking at Eleanor's uh, comment, I think you will see a, a very big difference in terms of this approach. Again, um, somebody had asked here too, I wanna make sure to point out, we, we have done professional development, the staff is really focused on this as well. And there's a lot of curriculum design work that's been done um, also to make sure that we have a different approach and capitalizing on the best practice in the places where it did go well in the spring and uh, really changing that program to, to look different um, on those other days. And, and for those who are all virtual. We don't know, Kristen, if regular testing would be a possibility. That's not something that's be, uh, been discussed. Um, I, I don't think that there's probably the capacity to do that, um, either here, but also just for that many tests uh, throughout the region, but uh, certainly something that we can ask about and, and keep in mind. Uh, uh, Courtney here is asking, maybe I missed it, but what will learning look like for students to go 100% virtual? Um, I did speak to that quite a bit. Uh, the plan is that that would be four out of six days face-to-face -face with an instructor and five out of six days, at, at, that's at the 612 level and five out of uh, six at the K through five level. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Danielle is asking about kindergarten. Uh, yep, we understand that. I wish, actually, frankly, that we had a full day program at this point too, but um, it's not that it wasn't thought out. We're just limited in terms of our options relative to um, our capacity as well. Heather, that's a great point. I think you'll see a lot more small group work. Heather asked uh, about additional small group work that helps people connect differently. 
uh, staff members asking about urban suburban program students and that there's absolutely no jeopardy whatsoever if urban suburban students choose to participate virtually just like any other student in this district. Uh, they absolutely have the opportunity to do that. As we often say, as far as we're concerned, urban suburban students are Brighton students, period. And it looks no different uh, for those students. Uh, we will uh, operate in the exact same way. So happy to have you take advantage of that opportunity if that works best for your families, absolutely. Uh, Ashley with a comment around uh, kindergarten. Again, we're very limited in terms of our uh, capacity and we wish that we could have had people here full time, but uh, we're not uh, we're not able to do that at this point relative to the social distancing and our capacity in terms of the number of staff we have available. And every district's going to be different that way and some are able to do that differently. Uh, we made a decision that we thought was in the best health and safety interest of our district based on what our parameters are. They made those decisions based on what they were able to provide in terms of space and the number of uh, people. Um, we did address technology and we will uh, provide uh, technology as needed in households and we are moving towards a uh, one-to-one -one for all of our students as quickly as we possibly can. We have supply chain uh, limitations as uh, well. So uh, Mike, there will be a cleaning in between uh, similar to our cleaning that will be done in the evenings. Uh, this is for a kindergarten question uh, that will thoroughly clean that classroom before the next group um, comes in. Okay, I'm just uh, working down here. Sorry to pausing. Uh, Vicki's question, why is in-person even being pursued? Uh, because we feel like we can do it to a limited degree in a safe manner. And we recognize, again, there is the issue uh, for us in terms of having that contact with students and, and the benefits to having students in school, uh, but also to families that although this is not an ideal solution because of their five day a week commitments to their job, uh, trying to provide something that is accommodating for families also. Again, if we could do that safely, uh, that's why we're in this position. But also knowing that if you do not feel comfortable with that, there will be a virtual experience um, also as well. So again, there, there are several other uh, questions here in the, in the Facebook uh, Live uh, comments. I'll get through as many as I can. We're just about um, out of time for that, but it will be part also of the follow-up that goes out on Friday with FAQs, um, et cetera. Lynn asked a great question about what we're doing regarding gym, band, orchestra, chorus. So we will on the non-in-person um, days for students have as much of an opportunity likely recorded uh, for them and independent learning in those areas also. As far as band, orchestra, chorus, there's different guidance around the social distancing required. It's 12 feet, uh, particularly when there's singing happening, and we will provide that kind of social distance as well. And we continue to work on the details regarding that um, also. And thanks, Aaron, for uh, that comment also. Glad Amy uh, points out that the extended school year program has been absolutely amazing and well thought out. Is there a way to mimic that model for special needs and immunocompromised children? Yeah, you know, and, and Amy, thank you for saying that. So we did offer that program this summer and that has been very helpful in our thinking about um, how to best do this and what worked really well. And uh, so I, I'm glad that worked for you and your family and that you recognize that that program worked well. Those are certainly the practices we wanna put in place uh, when people are coming into school also. and those. Uh, for those that don't know that the extended school year program is uh, for students who are provided that directly as a mandated service that wasn't uh, an open enrollment program that you missed, uh, but it is afforded to some students based on uh, particular needs. I'm just uh, scrolling through. And uh, yes, that question, uh, Christine's asking, we have provided professional development. The entire district has engaged in that professional development as well this summer or, or will be in the next couple of weeks. There's another session coming up um, also. Uh, Laura's asking, would the alphabet split be altered if large amount and one half end up being mostly completely remote learners? We would like to avoid making any changes to that because of the disruption, additional disruption that that uh, would cause. but. We may have to, depending on the numbers, make an adjustment and contact the community to make those adjustments. I, I would guess based just, you know, law of averages kind of thinking that 
in all likelihood, uh, people with last names A through L and people with last names N through Z will have similar rates of feeling differently about this or wanting to opt or having immune compromise issues that would require that, um, generally speaking, but uh, you know, not sure we would explore that if we need to, but as best we can, we'd like to stick to that. Uh, Yael has asked, can we switch days due to parents' work or other schedule? The plan is right now that you wouldn't be able to just because we may not be able to achieve a split. However, we would ask you to let your child's principal know that you have that interest. And if you do, and we have the opportunity where there's that one for one um, split and we can make those adjustments, we, we don't wanna be unreasonable about that or uh, not flexible in that. Uh, we are not planning on being able to do that. So I don't wanna give you false hope. Uh, but as we see exactly what the needs are, if we can make those adjustments, uh, we certainly want to know if people have a desire to do that and, and perhaps make those adjustments along the way. So we've reached uh, the end of our time together. I do want to thank you for uh, participating in, in this event. Uh, we will have more of these. We will get answers out to your questions. I know in a lot of cases, there's more questions right now than there are answers. And I apologize for that. I want you to understand that when we refer to guidelines or refer to to be determined, or we refer to that's upcoming and we're trying to figure that out, it's not because people are not working on that. It's not because they are not uh, you know, wanting to commit to things or make decisions, et cetera, or that they haven't thought about something. It's because we're trying to really respect the feedback that we're getting from people, make adjustments along the way, and understand emerging guidance, emerging information, and accommodate for that, and make the decisions we can that are best for our community, and, the, and above all, the safest for our community, and be thoughtful about that. So we, we may make adjustments along the way, um, and it's, it's not us wavering on things or, or not being clear in that, but we're trying to constantly evolve and constantly plan the thousand details that go into this, ultimately keeping safety as our first priority. So uh, that, that lack of commitment to some of these or it's to be determined is because we are adjusting along the way and making uh, decisions that we think are best uh, for everybody's health and safety as well. So thanks very much for joining us. I really I have one really practical question, um, just in terms of you were, you were laying out that you need this feedback from people about the remote and how many people are planning that. Sure. Are you, is that just coming in through that one survey that was sent out? Like, um, cause I know a lot of people might've answered not sure cause we don't know yet, but like half of those people or more could end up remote. And if you need that information in order to sort of build these plans for teachers and students, I'm wondering how we can definitely get that information to you in a timely manner so that you can make those decisions. So we are, and we'll send a reminder out about those surveys, really basing our initial decision-making on that feedback, understanding that the numbers may vary greatly after that. And then we'll have to revisit, you know, based on those numbers, what our decisions are going to be. So uh, I, I don't, Alexa, you're absolutely right. And it's, I don't think it's going to be a perfect science by any stretch. Um, that's right now the best way we can start in that decision-making. And then every decision leads then to another adjustment, will lead to another adjustment, will lead to another adjustment. So, um, you know, those will be the best numbers we know as of now, and then we'll have to make adjustments based on what people's feedback is going into uh, that August 17th timeframe. All yeah. right, so you bet. And again, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll do more of these, we'll announce the schedule. And, and when we send all the information out on Friday, uh, we'll announce those opportunities to re-engage in this conversation in some different ways also. So thanks very much for your participation, and we hope you have a very safe day, healthy day, a great day, and thank you for participating.